Good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us for tonight's Healing Perspectives Lecture with Dr. Aparna Dandekar. My name is Dr. Akhil Palanisamy, and I'm a physician at Sutter's Institute for Health and Healing in Sacramento. The Institute for Health and Healing offers integrative medicine clinical care that combines the best of conventional medicine with proven healing practices from around the world to serve the whole person. We have integrative medical clinics in San Francisco, Santa Rosa, Roseville, Sacramento, and San Carlos that offer integrative physician care, psychotherapy, acupuncture, nutrition, chiropractic, and massage therapy, all under the same roof. Many of our services are actually covered by insurance. So this Healing Perspectives series features clinical experts teaching practical approaches to well-being that blend conventional and holistic medicine. This is the last fall lecture for this year, and I'm happy to say that we've had almost 6,000 people attend our three free live events with tens of thousands more enjoying the replays on YouTube. So before we start, there are a few Zoom housekeeping items to go over. To adjust the view of the slide and presenter, you can adjust the slider between the two screens as highlighted in the red circle. This will be an interactive lecture. You will not be on camera, but we do encourage you to participate in the polls and Q&A. The chat is disabled, but will be turned on during a few poll questions. See the orange arrow indicating the chat button. The yellow arrow points to the Q&A button on your screen. For any technical difficulties, please ask through the Q&A button. We have a team monitoring your questions. And we do have a closed captioning option. There should be a button at the bottom of your screen to enable this. Just ask us in the Q&A if you need help with that. And we want this to be a very interactive lecture. We're gonna take um, questions at the end, but you can post your questions in the Q&A throughout the talk and we will uh, address them as much as we can at the end of the talk. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Aparna Dandekar. She's a doctor of osteopathy. So this means Aparna is board certified as a family practice physician, as well as an osteopath who does osteopathic physical manipulation with patients. She's also certified in Ayurveda, the traditional medicine of India. After graduating from medical school in 2002, she completed her residency at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles County Medical Center Family Medicine Program in 2005. She has spent the past 16 years caring for patients, families, and communities in Southern California and the Bay Area while working at UC Berkeley, Kaiser Permanente, and also in her own private practice. Currently, she sees patients at the Institute for Health and Healing in San Francisco, where she integrates ancient wisdom with her knowledge of osteopathy and Western medicine. So it's my honor to welcome Dr. Parna Dandekar, and please join me in a round of virtual applause. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Palanasamy. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Um, yes. Good. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm not here today because I've discovered an exciting new gene or a novel protein. On the contrary, I'm going to be talking about a very ancient medical science called Ayurveda, and I'll first introduce you to some of the basic concepts of Ayurveda, and then we'll move into how we can use it to guide us in this digital age that we live in. Can we go to the next slide? So I wanna pull the audience here. How many of you have heard of Ayurveda? And I'll bet most of you have come across it. It's everywhere nowadays, that ashwagandha that you take at bedtime for better sleep perhaps, or maybe a friend suggested that you try Garcinia for weight loss. Uh, maybe you had a mug of golden milk this morning. So um, let's see how many of you have heard about it. Um, so I'm looking at the polls on this screen up here. So it's kind of a even split, about 25% have never heard of it. So we will talk about that in this, um, in this talk today. Let's go to the next slide. So what is Ayurveda? It's an ancient medical science from India. It's said to have been written down about five to 7,000 years ago, but it probably existed in an oral tradition long before that. In the Sanskrit language, it translates into the science of life. 
Ayurveda is about aligning the body, the mind, the senses, and even the spirit with nature. And not just what we think about as mother nature around us, but our true nature. And I'm going to talk about that in just a bit. But we human animals forget that we are a part of nature because technology sometimes gives us that illusion or maybe delusion of being the overlords of nature. After all, we've manipulated it to our um, advantage and we can traverse the seas and the earth and the skies and even space. So technology is wonderfully liberating. However, I think it gives our species a sort of arrogance. I wanna talk about that today. Let's go to the next slide. So my patients often say, well, that's great. That's very interesting how ancient it is and all, but how is this old science from a faraway land relevant to me today? Uh, and that's what I wanna talk to you about. What can it teach us and how can it support us in this digital age where we, pre where we think we know pretty much everything there is to know? And so this slide shows us how forward thinking Ayurveda was. Ayurvedic physicians knew thousands of years ago that factors such as our behaviors or our environment can change gene expression for better or for worse. And what's more is that they knew that these changes were reversible. They were very aware of the concept of nature versus nurture. And this concept of epigenetic change is relatively recently starting to become more important in modern, modern medical science. But the effect of the, our environment around us was known to Ayurvedic scientists a long time ago, which is why Ayurveda is very personalized medicine. Things we do to improve our environment, such as quitting smoking, losing weight, eating healthier, can positively influence gene expression. So you're not, in, you're not merely your genes, rather you retain some control to either positively or negatively control the expression of some of those genes. Let's go to the next slide. So before, let me, let me touch on, upon some of the principles of Ayurveda in a nutshell. The science is really vast, so please bear in mind that I will be greatly oversimplifying it to fit into a 30 minute talk, but here we, here we go. Everything in the universe is made up of only five elements according to Ayurveda. Now, of course, when we read the ancient texts, there were indeed names for copper, iron, sulfur, and countless other elements that we recognize today. And there were even references to complex chemical reactions. People knew how to smelt metals out of ore. They knew how to make alloys. And Ayurveda even has an entire branch dedicated to toxicology. But at a macro level, there are only five main elements. Let's go to the next slide. Going from least to most dense, these elements were or are empty space. And yes, that's an element. And it's called akasha in Sanskrit. Air, also known as vayu. Fire, which is called agni. And by the way, this is pretty much the same root word that we see in ignition or ignite or igneous. So the same root, agni, igni. Water, which is jala. Earth, which is prithvi. And these elements combine in varying proportions to make up the entire known universe. Next slide, please. There, these five elements come together to create the three bioenergies or bioforces, we can call them, known as the doshas. And these three doshas govern the workings of our bodies, but also the universe around us. They are, and I'll be talking about them a lot, Vata, made up of space and air. Pitta, made up of fire and water. And Kapha, made up of earth and water. In simple terms, think of Vata as a gas, Pitta as a liquid, and Kapha being more like a solid. All three doshas are required for life. Next slide, please. Because Vata is a combination of empty space and air, it's light and clear. It's cold in temperature. It's present in bitter and astringent foods. Astringent flavor is what you'd experience if you bit into an unripe green banana. It makes your tongue feel dry. In our body, vata is responsible for all movement. So think of wind and think of motion. When we have too much of it, imagine a windstorm in our body. It creates physical and mental chaos as well as brittle dryness from all that motion of air. By the way, I will 
move through these slides rather quickly, but the presentation will be available on YouTube next week. We'll go to the next slide, please. As a generalization, people born with a high amount of vata in their bodies tend to have what we call a classic ectomorphic body type. They're slender and lean. Their strength is their flexibility. They are quick-witted and fast learners. And because wind can move quickly, their minds process information quickly too. Next slide, please. Pitta is a combination of fire and water. Think of it as a hot, oily acid. It's responsible for sour and pungent flavors in our food. Pungent foods are like onions, garlic, ginger, peppers, and they give our food that spicy heat. In the body, pitta is responsible for transformation and change. It breaks things down, it digests, and in doing so, it generates heat. It's also responsible for our metabolism and body heat, from what I just mentioned. Pitta, in addition to that, transforms raw data into ideas and thoughts. So whenever we get sensory input, for example, when we read something on our phone, Pitta takes lifeless words and transforms them into pictures and ideas in our brain. So for example, we use the expression food for thought, right? Or we say things like, it took me a while to digest that heavy lecture or to digest that book. So in this way, we're using Pitta as a metaphor. It takes raw material, whether food or sensory input, and transforms it into something useful. But when we have too much of it, imagine too much fire or acid in our body, it creates problems like inflammation, heartburn, even flared tempers. Let's go to the next slide. Folks born with a high proportion of pitta energy in them generally tend to have what we call a mesomorphic physique. They're medium size and height and build. They have an athletic build, you could say. Pitta gives them the power of being fantastic at analyzing data. They make great leaders, teachers, and researchers. And because of their fire energy, they digest food well and have strong appetites. Next slide, please. Kapha bioenergy in our body is a combination of earth and water. So it's heavy, dense, and cool in temperature. It can be hard like bone or viscous like muscle or like um, mucus, sorry, and it, it is also muscle. And it all depends on the water to earth ratio in that substance. It's present in flavors such as sweet and salty. And in our body, kapha is responsible for growth, mass, structure, stability, protection, and cushioning. When there is too much of it, imagine that denseness and cohesiveness of clay. It creates heaviness, congestion, stubbornness, and lethargy. Let's uh, go to the next slide, please. People who naturally have a higher proportion of kapha in their bodies, again, in general, tend to have what we call the classic endomorph body type. They have heavier frames, larger muscles, and denser bones. Now, this is important. A healthy kapha person is not necessarily overweight. However, they do tend to put on weight, such as muscle and fat, more easily than the other body types. They tend to be slow learners, but once they learn something, they don't forget it. They're very methodical in their learning methods, as opposed to Vata's learning style, which is they can cram for an exam, get an A, and then forget the material quickly. Because like the wind, they've moved on. And that's the difference. Guffas do not naturally enjoy exercise inherently, but once they get up and move, they have incredible endurance and stamina, and they can, they can outlast um, the other body types as far as um, physical exercise. Next slide, please. By now, you're probably trying to see yourself in these body types. Where do you fit in? But for the sake of simplicity, in the previous slides that I just presented to you, um, I presented what we call monodoshic people, vata types, pitta types, kapha types. But here in this Venn diagram, you can see there's quite a bit of overlap, giving us seven different, seven different body types. And I want to point out here, there is no right or wrong way to be. Each body type has its own superpowers and its own weaknesses. Next slide, please. Going back to nature versus nurture. 
Prakriti is the Sanskrit word for primordial nature. And this word can refer to nature around us. In the Hindu tradition, the word refers to God in female form, a dynamic, creative, kinetic, maternal force. In Ayurveda, however, it refers to our true nature, our inborn constitution, our genetic code. It is expressed as a ratio between vata, pitta, kapha. And the Ayurvedic physician arrives at this formula after taking a careful history and performing a physical exam. Let's go to the next slide, please. Vikruti is the word that denotes change in the body. And this is where the concept of epigenetics was recognized by the ancients. We deliberately do things to our bodies, good or bad, that change us. And sometimes things happen to us beyond our control, like accidents or other trauma. I'll give you a common example. Many a time, uh, identical twins who start out looking the same as children look different as adults. They start out with pretty much identical DNA, yet over time, they may be exposed to different environments or circumstances, causing different genes to turn off and on, ultimately causing them to look a little different. So Vikruti represents the changes we see in the body and mind that are superimposed on top of our true constitution. And the goal of Ayurvedic medicine is to uncover that prakriti, your true nature, once again, and to bring you back to your true nature, whatever specific ratio of VPK that you started with. Both prakriti and vikriti are determined by physical um, history, uh, physical exam and history. And um, it's really interesting. Sometimes during an appointment, patients will pull out their cell phone, speaking of technology and, and a great use of technology. And they'll show me old pictures of what they used to look like, you know, maybe an old Facebook profile or something. And they'll say, see how healthy I used to look? This was two years ago. Or see how clear my skin was? This was six months ago. What's happening to me? So it's an interesting use of technology. Let's go to the next slide. So really quickly here, I just want to touch upon this. No Ayurvedic discussion is complete without assessing the status of a patient's agni, which is the strength of their digestive fire, or the state of their malas, which is the word for waste. And the waste is feces, urine, and sweat. By the way, agni is here in this context is separate from the agni that we see in pitta, related but separate. The key is to take a good history and perform a thorough physical exam. Let's go to the next slide. So now you have a glimpse of how the three doshas govern our bodily functions. And I, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are very much part of nature. So it's no surprise that the rest, for, uh, the rest of the nature of nature around us is also governed by these bioenergetic forces. And so it goes for the 24 hour cycle as well, created by earth's rotation on its axis. Here we have a schematic drawing of a clock divided into vata, pitta and kapha time periods from 2 to 6 a.m. and again in the p.m., we have vata time. From 6 to 10, twice a day, once in the a.m. and once in the p.m., we have kapha time. And from 10 a.m. to 2 in the afternoon and again from 10 p.m. to early morning, 2, we have pitta time. There's a lot more significance to what this means. Certain organ systems and certain endocrine glands are more active at certain times. But I wanted to touch on the fact that the doshas cycle through our sleeping and waking hours. And this plays an important role in disease prevention and management. Let's go to the next slide. Vata, Pitta, Kapha also cycle through the seasons created by the Earth's revolution around the sun. Summer is hot. That's an obvious one associated with Pitta. And as we move into fall, the air turns dry and crisp, our skin starts to become dry like the leaves around us as the wind whips up and the humidity plummets. And as we move into winter, the weather becomes rainy, at least here in the Bay Area. This is kapha, all of that moisture. It also can take the form of snow. It's a, whole, uh, it's a heavy, cold, wet blanket. As the weather warms up in the spring, kapha continues its influence. It's still a wet season, but there's also a lot of growth. New animals are born, baby birds hatch, Plants and trees wake up, um, bears come out of hibernation. So um, that's how kapha is manifested in the spring. Mucus 
is a kapha secretion. And so in the spring, sinus congestion also builds up. And as the air then heats up as spring progresses, um, the kapha melts away and we find ourselves in summer, fit the season. Again, all over again with the prickly heat and the nosebleeds and other bodily changes. And so accordingly, there are recommendations that we make on how to adapt to these changes. Next slide. Thank you. Similarly, the dosha cycle through our human lifespan. Regardless of your body type, infancy and childhood is where kapha works to create growth and development. From young adulthood until we're in our early 50s is bit the time where we need that extra fire to sustain our lives and livelihoods through midlife. And then we all naturally move into the vata stage of life. So at this stage, for example, even if you're a kapha person, you may start to experience some of those vata imbalances that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Let's revisit that daily clock. There are things that all of us can do whether or not we know our mind-body constitution. Ayurveda says that we need to pattern our sleep-wake cycle with the solar cycle. On average, we need to sleep by 10, uh, 1030 and wake up around 6, 630 with the sun and birds. There's no such thing as a, being a night owl. We have excellent trichromatic vision. We, we see color. We, we are not uh, animals who see in the dark. And I would say one of the most important and early technologic, uh, technologic advances was the light bulb. It catapulted the human into a super animal. But the flip side is that, that it entices us to stay up late into the night and makes some of my patients insist that they're night owls. And the blue light emitted from screens disrupts sleep even more. What did our ancestors do? They gathered around a fire, they hung out, and then they went to bed. They maybe exchanged stories around the fire. That was their entertainment. Maybe they had candles to light up their homes, but they were never bright enough to stimulate them into staying so late in the, into the night, staying up, doing last minute things. Um, we should eat our largest meal at noon. And so why is this a thing? Because our internal fire, our agni, is very much in tune with the sun. Ayurveda teaches us to take our uh, largest meal at lunchtime because that's when the sun is at its zenith and our internal digestive fire is also cranked up to its highest power. Remember, this is a completely different model from Western medicine, so stay with me in this model. Um, a lot of my patients have remarked that they don't care for a big breakfast, and this is Ayurvedic wisdom talking to you. This is your body's wisdom talking to you. And that's because after a long fast, sleeping all night, the, the agni or the fire is turned down very low. As we feed it a small breakfast, the fire grows so that by lunchtime, we can give it a big meal. And then again, the fire dies down for the evening and for the night. So have a big lunch and no snacking either because that overwhelms the fire and causes insulin resistance. Um, eating seasonally and locally, if we can, for our constitution is something we can all strive to do. Um, the specifics of what you should eat for your dosha is a detailed discussion, but all of us can eliminate um, or cut down on um, junk foods, emotional eating, uh, unnecessary snacking, and all of us can eliminate ice in our beverages because that really slows down and extinguishes the fire. We all know that cutting processed foods is a good idea, it has a lot of salt and preservatives. Um, so these are things we can all do. And then poop once a day to eliminate toxins. How many of us can say we're truly regular? I know my vata and uh, kapha patients have a hard time with this sometimes. Pittas tend to poop more often, um, but even sometimes they need help. Healthy pooping is daily pooping. So if your version of regularity is once every other day, then we need to talk. Um, we should also exercise daily and per our constitution and not excessively either. Let's go to the next slide. In summary, depending on your mind-body constitution, Ayurveda prescribes different treatment plans. Um, and there's some basic things all of us should do, which I already mentioned, but we should also get some fresh air and outdoor time, stick with a routine and keep the mind healthy and challenged. And most importantly, listen to our body's wisdom as it's always talking to us. For example, if you suffer from hot flashes, should you really be in that hot yoga class? If you feel uncomfortably full, you know, you're zipping down your pants, should you still be reaching for more food? 
And if your eyes are tired, tired like my like I am, if your eyes are tired and dry and you're yawning, do you need to stay up and watch more TV? Don't dismiss these signals as nuisances. They're there for a reason. Let's go to the next slide. So imbalance can look like a lot of things. One of the big things is gut issues. And Ayurvedic physicians discovered leaky gut syndrome thousands of years ago. And there's other things that happen too. Um, irritable bowel, sleep disordered breathing, snoring, sleep apnea, um, brain fog. We need to pay attention to the warning signals in our body before disease onset. So again, um, if you're eating until it hurts, don't do that. If you're being a martyr and trying to help others when you have no reserves of your own, don't do that. Because in order to self-preserve, we have to set, set boundaries for ourselves and for other, others around us. So that was Ayurveda in a nutshell at breakneck speed. I wanted to talk to you more, but we're going to move on. Um, let's talk about today's day and age. Let's move to the next slide, please. So we live in a wonderful era. And as far as health and longevity go, there's no time like today to be alive. Technology is harnessed for good of humankind, and it's magnificent. And I'm not here to disparage the many amazing and obvious benefits of technology to which we all owe, owe our lives. But I want to talk about completely handing over our autonomy little by little insidiously to the ever encroaching advances of technology and relying solely on tech to the point of letting go of our natural instincts and ignoring the signals the body is always trying to send us. By the way, I'm fully aware that I'm connecting with all of you through the gift of technology. So I do embrace technology. Just want that to be clear. Let's go to the next slide. But there is another side. With our human intelligence and opposable thumbs, our species has always invented and progressed, starting with simple machines like the wheel and the inclined plane to eventually ushering in the industrial revolution of the 18th century. But never before in human history have we made as much progress in such a condensed time, I think, as since the start of the digital age. And for decades, we watched these advancements of technology. We embraced them as they enhanced our lives. And up until recently, we could keep up. We could follow along and adapt. But now suddenly, I feel like if we step away from development, even for a moment, let's say we forget our phone at home, we feel naked and lost. We feel we're missing out and that the world is passing us by. Let's go to the next slide. So if we lose our phone, it's like losing part of our body and we don't feel whole and complete. And we wonder how before the advent of the smartphone, which came around 2007, not too long ago, we wonder how we ever did anything at all. Without apps to tell us when to exercise, how much water to drink, or provide us with white noise, we don't know how to structure our day. And we have no confidence in our own physiology. It's too prim primitive and passe to just feel sleepy and fall asleep. We need an app to help us with that. Um, when we didn't have um, these things, when we didn't have um, light bulbs, when we had candlelight, there was nothing better to do in the evening. So we naturally wound down and we went to sleep. Well, we can't do that anymore. Our productivity app will chime and remind us to do one more thing. Again, tech is not bad, but it's bad when we relinquish our common sense to an external system. And the more and more we find ourselves suppressing that inner voice, we don't trust our bodies anymore. And we're paralyzed into thinking we're not enough and that our common sense is not enough. Tech gives us, I think, an illusion of freeing up our time. And in doing so, we overextend ourselves like we have never before in human history. Let's go to the next slide. So knowing how, um, what you know now about Ayurveda and how it views life, um, can you see how technology suppresses us in some ways? Remember the concepts of Dhinacharya, which is the daytime routine and Rutucharya, which is seasonal routines? Um, Over-reliance on, te on technology disrupts these natural patterns. How is it influencing nutrition? For example, I'll give you a simple example. We talked about how pitta digests food and information earlier. What about if we try both at the same time? What, how many of us will eat and watch TV at the same time or play video games or answer emails? Something's gotta give and it's usually digestion and, and mindful eating because technology is far more attractive. So we end up paying more attention to the device than to our intake. 
So there's only so much pitta to extend uh, or expend rather at one time. So where are you going to choose to divert it is the question. Let's go to the next slide. I hate to use this cliche, we've all heard that sitting is the new smoking. So when we're glued to a screen, we're not moving and we're not outdoors, we're not in the sunshine. And so there's no vitamin D being made in our skin and we're increasing our chances of bad vision. And we're also likely bent over with poor posture and all the kids have it these days. As an osteopathic doctor, this is a nightmare for me to see a whole generation of people in my office with postural issues, text neck, carpal tunnel issues, it's a nightmare. Let's go to the next slide. Spontaneous play is important because it seems really simple on the surface, but it lays the foundation for healthy social behavior, such as making proper eye contact, taking turns, being inclusive of others, reading social cues. And we see crying babies being soothed with smartphones and smart pads. Kids are socializing differently now and screen addiction is starting early. With videos um, that are fed to them, kids aren't using their imagination anymore. And they're bored and lost without their devices. Little children. When my son, who's 15 now, when he was eight, I chaperoned a field trip for his class. We went to a beautiful park on the bay with lovely wide open vistas. And the teacher pointed out a turkey hawk in the sky. What did the kids do? They took their phones up into the sky and tried to scan the sky with their phones. They didn't look up and move their necks and move their eyes. What a waste, such a narrow field of vision. The kids were frustrated because in their little viewfinders of their phone, they couldn't see the bird when they could have just put the phone down and looked around a bit. Their world has shrunk and their eyes only focus a few inches from the face, missing out on peripheral vision locking up those eye muscles that are responsible for changing lens shape as we focus near and far. So what sort of vision problems are we gonna have? 20 years from now, are we gonna look back two generations and wonder how we ever saw anything without glasses? And are we going to rely then on more technology to help us see better? Because by then maybe we'll feel that our eyes are inferior and incomplete without technology to aid them. One more quick example. We go to Tahoe every year uh, with seven other families and you rent a house with um, all these rooms and the parents hang out and the kids do their own thing. And one year the, the house is really quiet and the kids were, we couldn't hear them. So we kind of went upstairs to spy on them and see what they were doing. They were 18 kids in one room. They were all on a device. Some kids were texting each other and some two of the kids were FaceTiming each other in a room. It, it's a true story. So one of the mothers who was an ER doc um, went around and confiscated all the phones, which was great because then the kids went out and played and they discovered that there's snow outside. So um, this is how we have to kind of teach the new generation that devices are not the end all and be all. I didn't let my daughter who's now 18, we didn't let her have a smartphone till she was 16. So that's a little extreme, but I think she's grateful. It's different for every family. Let's go to the next slide. We need to gain an appreciation for the innate wisdom our bodies naturally possess. We don't have, uh, we don't have to teach our platelets how to fix a cut. We don't need an app for our hair to grow and our noses filter air beautifully. We are walking miracles. Our intelligence is real. It's not artificial. And our bodies are capable of so much. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, quick poll. Think back on all the hours you spend trying to keep up with text, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, dating apps, WhatsApp, Twitter, voicemails, doom scrolling. It's crazy. And I'm no exception to this rule. I'm not a beacon of inspiration. I'm, it, I'm struggling along with you. We're trapped in phones and technology and technology is needy. Grandparents are pressured into getting uh, onto smartphones just to relate to their grandkids this, these days. And I think with technology, um, we are expected to be perfect, ever present. Everything's orchestrated for us. There's no room for human error. And that's considered poor form. I'm gonna get rid of this, okay, on my screen. So zero to two, okay. I wonder what age demographic we have in the audience, okay. 54% said zero to two hours and 2% said nine plus. Those 2% people were very honest. I appreciate that. 
So anyway, technology um, makes us, uh, expects us to be perfect and there's no room for, for sloppy human error and it's considered poor form. So last month I took an Uber home from the airport and my 20 something Uber driver backed up into my driveway so that I could unload my luggage from his truck, which was really nice. Um, but then he said something that was funny. He said his rear view camera was broken and he was very proud to tell me that he backed into my driveway all by himself without using his camera. And then he kind of paused and waited for me to, I don't know, congratulate him for backing into my driveway. And I honestly think for him, it was an act of bravery because without that camera, he was seriously putting himself at risk for failure. So that's what's happening with this new generation. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, I, I've been told I gotta speed it up. Um, the average American spends um, 11 hours on screen every day of that nearly six hours on mobile phones and daily phone usage by Gen Z is 10 hours. Um, we all thought addiction was limited to drugs, alcohol, codependent behavior, gambling, but now we all have an addiction to screens, to constant information, and for that reward we feel when we get um, attention from peers on social media. It's literally a dopamine hit. Let's go to the next slide. Social media is fun, I use it. It's good to keep in touch with people and it's a powerful force to galvanize the masses into taking action for good causes. But we don't need to blindly follow every trend on social media. Um, there are a lot of adverse effects to our health, emotional intelligence, and even cognition. If you do an internet search on TikTok Tourette's, you'll see what I mean. It's not really Tourette's, but it's a stress response in kids. Social media gives us the freedom to create fake versions of ourselves. Um, it creates the need for constant adulation and approval. And it also gives us a feeling of inadequacy, like we're left out of better lives that our friends have. Maybe as adults, we can see the folly in this, but can children really, can they make that judgment? And it also, social media also gives us less inhibition so we can say horrible things to each other from behind our screens with impunity. Um, as we defy all social norms of decency, because it's brave to be behind a keyboard. So I think this is all a time. This is a time when all of us can use a little bit more introspection in our social media behavior. Next slide. Where are you not connecting with your bodily wisdom? Scan your day, scan the past week, and look ahead and reflect on basic things sleep, nutrition, exercise, hydration, connection with loved ones, connection with yourself. Let's go to the next slide. Ayurveda, the ancient system of medicine can teach us how to disconnect from the digital world and connect to our natural rhythms of our bodies. It can help us create daily awareness so that we can implement steps to feel better. Let's go to the next slide, please. So what is one small thing that you can do today to make a change so that you have about two months from today to get into a new habit before the new year begins? And it could be anything. Um, think about how you want to align yourself with nature. Maybe you power down electronics at 9 p.m. so that you can fall asleep easily by 10 and then you can wake up with the sun at six. Maybe you stop watching TV while you're eating dinner so that your pitta can focus on digesting food and not data. Um, maybe it's an effort to set limits on screen time and get outside. Today is important for me because it's Diwali, which is um, very important. And so it's a nice time for me to turn over a new leaf and make new changes. I'm personally going to try to limit my email checking to twice a day, maybe 10 minutes at a time, I'm thinking. Um, instead of checking my phone all day long. And that's one change I will make to lighten my electronic burden. So wish me luck on that. It's not gonna be easy. Um, but I'd be curious as to what you would like to do to start these changes. Um, let's go to the next slide. I know we went through a lot of information um, and there was so much more I wanted to talk about, but I really um, cut things short because you know, to stay within time. Um, but if you want to delve deeper, here are some great resources to read. And that's the end of my talk. We can go to the next slide. I believe it's 
um, questions. Thanks for coming again. And um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dandekar. If we had another hour, I'm sure we could go into you know so many more questions that have come through. But thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for coming. Yeah. So we are able to offer this event for free thanks to donations, especially from the Roberta E. Neustadter Mini Medical School in Integrative Medicine. And we would like to also thank Sutter Bay and Valley Medical Foundations for their support of our work. So we wanna make sure you know about um, upcoming free lectures. Um, we'll be resuming again, of course, in the new year. So please stay informed about upcoming events. You can click on the link in the chat box um, to sign up to our um, newsletter to be informed about, about that. And so today you learned about an integrative perspective on health um, through Ayurveda. So please give us a call if you'd like to learn more and take an integrative perspective on your own health. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we have clinics um, all around the Bay Area in um, uh, multiple locations. Uh, you can also visit our myhealthandhealing.org website. And once this um, uh, event concludes, you'll immediately receive a survey. So we read every survey and um, highly value your feedback. So please let us know what you think. So thanks again also for joining us. Have a great night and uh, hoping to see you again at our um, events in the new year.